Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Live, India's voice to the world. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran, coming up in the next 30 minutes. India dismisses China's claims on Arunachal Pradesh as baseless. New Delhi says the northeastern state is an integral and inalienable part of India. India's Minister of External Affairs, Subramanyam Jashanka, says Palestinians have been denied a homeland, underlines the importance of two-state solution. Israel asks the US to reschedule a scrapped meeting on Rafa military plan. Tensions escalate on Israel's border with Lebanon. And Russia doubts Islamic State hand in the Moscow concert hall attack. Death toll rises to 143, 95 still missing. India on Thursday called China's claims on Arunachal Pradesh as baseless. The spokesperson of Ministry of External Affairs said that India has time and again made its position clear and issued statements to that effect. He said Arunachal Pradesh is and will remain an integral part of India. China may repeat its baseless claims as many times as they want. That is not going to change our position. Arunachal Pradesh was, is and will remain and always remain an integral and inalienable part of India. The 29th meeting of the Working Mechanism for Consultation and Coordination on India-China Border Affairs was held in Beijing on Wednesday. The two sides exchanged views on how to achieve complete disengagement and resolve the remaining issues along the line of actual control in the western sector of the India-China border areas. In the interim, both sides agreed to maintain regular contact through diplomatic and military channels and uphold peace and tranquility on the ground in accordance with existing bilateral agreements and protocols. Meanwhile, India's Ministry of Home Affairs on Thursday extended the Armed Forces Special Powers Act 1958 in certain areas of the country's northeastern state of Arunachal Pradesh for a period of six months. The areas concerned have been declared as a disturbed area with effect from 1st April. The step has been taken after a review of the security situation in those areas of the state. The spokesperson of India's Ministry of External Affairs has reiterated the country's position on Ukraine. The official called for a resolution through dialogue and diplomacy. Also, warring sites must be open to explore all ways to establish peace. Through dialogue and uh, uh, diplomacy and remain open to uh, engaging all ways and means that would help achieve this objective. Ukraine's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Dmitry Kuleba, laid a wreath at Rajkhat in India's capital, New Delhi, on Thursday to pay homage to Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the nation. On Friday, the Ukrainian minister will hold talks with India's External Affairs Minister, Subramaniam Jayashankar, and Deputy National Security Advisor, Vikram Misri. He will also engage with members of the business community. Ahead of his visit, Minister Kuleba said that Ukraine sees India as an important global power. India is welcome to be uh, to, co to cooperate to engage with Ukraine on economic projects now, and of course uh, uh, to engage in the reconstruction of Ukraine. The minister welcomed India's participation in the reconstruction of Ukraine. In other news, Russia and Ukraine continued with attacks on each other. Moscow claims to have launched strikes on targets, including 
the storage points of drones used by Ukraine. For its part, Ukraine claims to have repelled multiple Russian offensives and launched airstrikes on Russian positions. The Ukrainian army attacked Russian military personnel and military equipment, hitting important targets such as the Russian air defense systems. Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, is tightening its security after a series of missile attacks by Russia. The head of Kyiv's military administration said that the City Defense Council will review the staging of public events and enhance security around large gatherings. The measures come as Russia launched several missile attacks on Ukraine. The Moscow Concert Hall at massacre has sparked a blame game with Russia now saying that it was extremely hard to believe that the Islamic State would have had the capacity to launch the attack. It reiterated that Ukraine was behind the attack. The death toll has now risen to 143. 95 people are missing. Investigators, meanwhile, continue to question eight suspects, one of them, Amin Chon Islamov has appealed against his pre-trial detention. Islamov, a native of Tajikistan, is suspected of aiding four Tajik nationals who attacked the Con Crocus City Hall venue. Meanwhile, Russia has bolstered its security and is calling for international efforts to combat terrorism. The new security initiatives have led to tangible results, including the detention of a terror suspect in the Samara region. Amid reports of the West supplying F-16 fighters to Ukraine, Russia's President Vladimir Putin has said that they will be shot down by the Russian forces if used. Speaking to the Russian Air Force pilots, Putin said that the U.S.-led military alliance had expanded eastward towards Russia since the 1991 fall of the Soviet Union, but Moscow had no plans to attack a NATO member. The Kremlin accuses the U.S. of fighting against Russia by supporting Ukraine with money, weapons and intelligence. It also says that relations with the U.S. have probably never been worse. Ambassadors from the European Union countries reached a revised deal on Wednesday to extend tariff-free food imports from Ukraine but with certain restrictions. The agreement now goes to the European Parliament, where diplomats expect a push to add more sanctions. Now, Belgium, which holds the EU rotating presidency, said that the agreement secured a balanced approach between support for Ukraine and protection of EU agricultural markets. But some EU farming groups and countries, such as France and Poland, have argued that the measures needed to be tightened to avoid making agricultural products uncompetitive. President Emmanuel Macron of France has reacted sharply to the troubled talks over a free trade deal between the EU and South America's bloc Mercosur. On the last day of his visit to Brazil, Macron called it a very bad deal that lacks proper climate considerations. He says the deal is outdated and needs to be reworked. For its part, Brazil said that it is ready to sign the deal. France has repeatedly expressed reservations on the deal, saying that its farmers have objected to the prospect that could allow in agricultural imports, notably beef, that does not meet EU standards. The deal is supposed to ease trade barriers between the EU and the South American Mercosur bloc, despite growing opposition from France. I deeply believe that we need to rethink our trade rules in light of this advantage, which is why I prefer to put my foot down in front of this assembly. I have spoken out very forcefully to say that Makassar, as it is negotiated today, is a very bad agreement. But I think it's a very bad deal for you and for us. Meanwhile, the presidents of France and Brazil launched a submarine built in Brazil with French technology as part of a project to build Brazil's first nuclear-powered submarine by the end of the decade. Presidents Emmanuel Macron and Lula da Silva attended a ceremony in a shipyard near the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro to launch a third diesel-powered submarine built as part of a $10 billion partnership. The submarine program, which started in 2008 during President Lula's previous term, 
is a partnership with France's state-run Naval Group To West Asia now, Israel has asked the U.S. to reschedule a high-level meeting on military plans for Gaza's southern city of Rafah. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had previously cancelled the visit after the U.S. did not veto a Gaza ceasefire resolution adopted by the United Nations Security Council on 25th of March. The Prime Minister's office uh, has agreed, has agreed uh, to reschedule the meeting dedicated to Rafa. So we're, we're uh, now working uh, with them to set, to find a convenient date uh, that's obviously going to work for both sides. But he, his office has agreed uh, to, uh, to reschedule that meeting that would be dedicated uh, to Rafa, which is a good thing. The U.S. also said that it believes that hostage talks with Israel and Hamas are not over yet and that Washington, D.C. sees an opportunity to continue pursuing the release of the hostages. The hostage negotiations we do not believe are over. We do not believe they've come to an end. Uh, we believe that there is uh, an ability to continue to pursue uh, the release of hostages, and that's what we're going to continue to do. India's Minister of External Affairs, Subramaniam Jayashankar, has said that the Palestinians have been denied a homeland. He reiterated India's support for a two-state solution to address the Israel-Palestinian conflict. He made the remarks during his visit to Malaysia. On the one hand, what happened on October 7th was terrorism. On the other hand, nobody would, uh, you know, countenance the deaths of innocent civilians. Countries may be, uh, may be uh, justified at least in their own minds in responding. But you cannot have a response which does not, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, every response must take into account something called international humanitarian law. And the fact is that whatever the rights and wrongs of the issue, there is the underlying issue of the rights of the Palestinians and the fact that they have been denied their homeland. Spain on Wednesday airdropped 26 tons of humanitarian aid into Gaza. The operation carried out in coordination with Jordan and co-financed by the European Union involved two Airbus A400 military planes dropping more than 11,000 food packets and supplies. All right, now take a look at some more stories making news around the world. Fiji's former Prime Minister Frank Bainimarama was discharged from court on Thursday after being convicted last week for perverting the course of justice. In Fiji, an absolute discharge is the lowest level sentence that an offender can get. It means that no conviction is registered against Bainimarama. He led Fiji for 16 years and came to power in a 2006 coup and later won democratic elections in 2014 and 2018. Dozens of anti-mining protesters held a sit-in outside Ecuador's capital, Quito, as tensions continue over mining rights. The demonstration took place to oppose government plans to pave the way for the mining of gold, silver and copper. Ecuador has been under a state of emergency since January to quell a wave of gang violence. Thousands joined hands on Wednesday to form a human chain at Nashville in the U.S. state of Tennessee and remember the victims of an elementary school shooting one year on. Last March, a 28-year-old former student stormed into the private convent school with rifles and killed three nine-year-old children along with three staff members. The shooting prompted cries for gun control and led to large protests in the state capital. Following several years of Ramzan coinciding with the sweltering Saudi Arabian summer, locals in the country's capital Riyadh were happy to witness school weather during this year's holy month of Ramzan. With temperatures hovering around 20 degrees Celsius, the Saudis were seen strolling and dining outdoors. Still to come on DD India Live. 
Divers res recovered two bodies from the site of a bridge collapse in the U.S. city of Baltimore. After London, now New York City to charge a fee for private and commercial vehicles in a bid to reduce traffic congestion. And the 10th edition of India's Seychelles Joint Military Exercise, codenamed Lamitiye 24, concludes. Hong Kong passes a draconian national security law. Has democracy died in Hong Kong? Was there a secret weapon behind the mysterious Havana syndrome that shook American diplomacy? In the last decade was the hottest ever. Is our planet on the brink? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 p.m. IST on DD India. You're watching DD India Live. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. The bodies of at least two of the six people missing after the U.S. bridge collapse in Baltimore have been recovered. An investigation is on to determine the cause of the incident. New insights into the Baltimore bridge collapse have emerged a day after massive cargo ship Dali lost power and struck a support pillar of Francis Scott Key Bridge. The pilot of the cargo freighter had radioed for tugboat help and reported a power loss minutes earlier. This is according to the ship's black box data recorder. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board Chair Jennifer Hamendi said investigation is expected to take between 12 to 24 months. This bridge was in satisfactory condition. The fra last fractural, fracture critical inspection was in May 2023. We have not uh, been able to go through that inspection and all the documents, that, but that will occur after we leave uh, the on-scene portion. And so I have no doubt that we will be, be able to pull this uh, together uh, in, in hopefully 12 to 24 months. Divers on Wednesday recovered the remains of two of the six workers missing since the accident. Divers recovered two, two victims of this tragedy trapped within the vehicle. The victims were identified as Alejandro Hernandez Fuentes, 35 years old, of Baltimore, and Dorlian Raniel Castillo Cabrera, 26 years old, of Dundalk. Divers have been swimming in chilly waters with metal debris from the bridge that fell in the river but has over 1.5 metric gallons of fuel oil and lube oil on board. The vessel is stable but it still has uh, over one and a half million gallons of fuel oil and lube oil on board and it does have 4,700 cargo containers on board. 56 of those contain hazardous materials and two are missing overboard. The economic fallout in the U.S. due to the accident could be staggering. Economic numbers, about 8,000 jobs we think are directly implicated uh, and uh, over $100 million of cargo uh, moves in and out of that port a day. Analysts are also warning the economic impact of a down bridge could be felt across the globe, with some suggesting it may lead to a temporary increase in prices of coal in India as U.S. producers are forced to find new shipping routes. In a bid to reduce traffic in Manhattan's central business district, reduce pollution and provide critical funding for transit improvements, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority Board voted on Wednesday to approve a toll rate for Manhattan's congestion pricing program, the first of its kind in the United States. Under the plan, New York City will charge a daily toll of $15 during the day for passenger vehicles driving in Manhattan, south of the 60th Street, starting mid-June. It will charge up to $36 for larger trucks and buses. The plan still faces a number of legal challenges, including from the state of New Jersey. New York City, which has the most congested traffic of any U.S. city, 
is set to follow London, which implemented a similar charge in the year 2003. Commuting eased for the more than 9 million people of South Korea's capital Seoul as the hours-long bus strike ended on Thursday. The strike was called off after a deal was reached between Seoul's bus union and its employers to hike wages by 4.48 percent. The unions had originally asked for an almost 13 percent wage increase. The full-scale strike by the city's bus drivers was the first in 12 years. Their last strike lasted around 20 minutes. The 10th edition of the India Seychelles Joint Military Exercise, codenamed Lamitiye 24, ended on Wednesday in Seychelles. High standards of professionalism and training were on full display by the soldiers of both nations. India and Seychelles enjoy a strong defense cooperation. The soldiers trained, planned and executed a series of tactical drills for neutralizing likely threats that may be encountered in a semi-urban environment while exploiting and showcasing new generation equipment and technology. The 10-day long joint exercise included field training exercise, combat discussion, lecture and demonstration. The sea phase of a tri-service humanitarian assistance and disaster relief exercise between India and the U.S., codenamed Tiger Triumph, began in the Bay of Bengal on Thursday. The three-day exercise includes units of both countries setting up a joint command and control center and joint relief and medical camp. A planning and coordination exercise is being undertaken to discuss and refine standard operating procedures to enable rapid and smooth coordination between the forces of both countries. The exercise represents the robust strategic partnership between both countries and aims to share the best practices and standard operating procedures in undertaking multinational operations. The harbour phase of the exercise was conducted at Vishakhapatnam last week. The Israel Aerospace Industries announced on Thursday that it has opened its Indian subsidiary in New Delhi. The opening of Aerospace Services India is seen as a demonstration of the Israeli aerospace and defense company's strong collaboration with the Indian government's self-reliant India and Make in India initiatives. The Israeli company has India's defense research and development organization as one of its partners. The DRDO is India's premier agency for military research and development. The Israeli company boasts a workforce of about 50 employees, with 97% being Indian nationals. It trades in the Indian currency rupee. India has condemned and lodged its strong objection protest by the senior official from U.S. Embassy with regard to comments made by the U.S. State Department with regard to the arrest of Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal. The spokesperson of Indian Ministry of External Affairs in a media briefing said the recent remarks by the State Department are unwarranted and any such external imputation on India's electoral and legal processes is completely unacceptable. The spokesperson said in India, legal processes are driven by the rule of law. The recent remarks by the State Department are unwarranted. Any such external imputation on our electoral and legal processes is completely unacceptable. In India, legal processes are driven only by the rule of law. Anyone who has similar ethos, especially fellow democracies, should have no difficulty in appreciating this fact. All right, take a look now at some other stories making news in India. The first aircraft LA-5033 of India's Tejas Mark 1A aircraft series took to the skies from Hindustan Aeronautics Limited's facility in Bengaluru on Thursday. It was a successful sortie with a flying time of 18 minutes. India's National Testing Agency has issued advanced intimation slip for allotment of examination city to applicants appearing for the second session of the joint entrance examination mains this year. 
The government of India has notified a 3 to 10 percent increase in wages for the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act workers for the financial year 24-25. The new wage rates will come into effect from 1st April. The average wage for 24-25 will be 289 rupees as compared to 261 rupees for 23-24. As daytime temperatures breach 40 degrees Celsius, the India Meteorological Department has issued a heat wave warning for India's Rajasthan, Saurashtra, Kutch region and northern Karnataka. The day temperatures over western and central Indian regions are expected to hover between 38 and 42 degrees Celsius till the end of this month. A Soviet-era Russian rock band Picnic, whose concert in Crocker City Hall near Moscow last week, was attacked by gunmen, staged a memorial show in St. Petersburg on Wednesday. The veteran band Picnic received a standing ovation at a memorial concert. Initially, band members were thinking of cancelling the Wednesday gig, but it took place after all with a band saying that all the money will be donated to the victims of the deadly attack. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of DD India Live. Let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X and Instagram. You can also check out our website, ddindia.co.in. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. From all of us here in New Delhi, thanks for watching DD India Live.